<laughs> Let's get the vibe, thank you. <clears throat> the question I have for all of you, I'll start with you. Tell me where the name Junkalo came from, because it's such a great name. And each, of, each of you guys have such a great name for your, for your stuff. Tell thank me where you. It came from. So I moved, to, I moved back to LA after spending seven years in Italy. And um, well, where in Italy were you? I was in Florence. Oh. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was in Florence, Italy for seven years and I moved to New York and after a couple years in New York, it was a little too intense, missed California, came back and lived on my own for the very first time because I had been with roommates and boyfriends and whatever else for the previous years and obviously my family. Um, and this was in 2008, 2009 and I had um, botanical wallpaper all over my little tiny bungalow in Las Feliz, and I had a million plants, and I had um, friends visiting from New York and sleeping on my sofa, and we were drinking wine and hanging out, and you know, my friend Sorette, she was looking around and she goes, this is such a cute little bungalow. It's, it's like a jungle in here. <laughs> and like, we all looked at each other, we were like, jungle! <laughs> And it took years for me to actually change my brand name to Junglo. And the way that that came about was that at flea markets, mostly the Rose Bowl flea, which I go to pretty much religiously, um, people started calling me the Junglo girl there. They're like, oh, you're, you're like that Junglo girl. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I, so I, I rebranded when I, I had everything under my name, Justina Blakeney, and I rebranded as Junglo, and it was just explosive. And it really took off from there. It's such an evocative name, and and it's this thing now. Like you said, I think he was being. Forgive me for saying this, the jungle girl. So it's it's. <laughs> but it also, it kind of speaks to the aesthetic. I think of the brand too, doesn't it? Absolutely, and I think there's there's a sort of a what came first, the chicken or the egg thing, because I think once I embraced, because my style's always been global and um, really colorful and textured and layered, and I've always loved plants. But it was sort of once I decided to really own that that name for the brand, Jungalo, it was like I could even turn the volume up on the whole jungle plant thing even more. Mm -hmm. And so I think there was a little bit of like synergy there to say, okay, this is something that's really making me stand out. It's really something that separates me from the masses, and I'm just going to kind of lean into that. And what about you, Maurice? Um, <clears throat> I was working at Juicy Couture at the time and like not feeling so fulfilled for my job and I would do flowers on the side for people. I also had this crazy obsession um, with feathers <laughs> and I collected lots of vintage, I just had boxes and boxes of. I'm sorry, something you say you collect feathers. I just wanna make sure that. <laughs> yeah, feathers. <laughs> okay. And um, my assistant at the time was like, oh, you're gonna do my friend's wedding. Um, she got money. Uh, but you gotta, you gotta have a business card. And I was like, okay. And so then my best friend and I were like, just talking about it, like, what is, like, what do you name a business? I was like, I definitely don't want it to have my name um, because I, if I don't like it or if it turns into something, I don't want to be overly identified with my brand in that way. Um, and so then I was like, well, I'm obsessed with flowers and I'm obsessed with feathers, but like, you can't have a business called Flowers and Feathers. I guess you could, <laughs> but like, it just didn't sound really it elegant. It doesn't sound bad to me, but okay. You know, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, my best friend gonna... like, was just like, what about like, he, he said he kept like a notebook and was trying to help me like come up with a name, and he was like, what about like Bloom and Plume? And like when it was written out, it looked so beautiful with like the ampersand and the whole thing, and I was just like, oh my God, I love that. And then I was at another friend's house, and um, the silhouette to my logo is um, my Disneyland cutout from when I was like 22, um, <laughs> where you go down Main Street and they cut out your silhouette in like a minute. And I was like, this is trash. This doesn't look anything like me. This is like a little woman. And I was like, <laughs> I, you know what I mean? And so, but my best friend, my other best friend was like, I love it. <laughs> and um, kept, it on, uh, kept it on the refrigerator for like years. And then when we were like uh, going through the, my other friend was like, oh my God, use this. And I was like, oh my God, that looks amazing. And so just the look of it really, I loved. But to date, I find the name a little bit challenging because it's very hard to say. 
bloom and plume, bloom and plume. You're just like, bloom and bloom? Like, <laughs> bloom and who? And it's just like, ugh, the email thing. It, anyways, I, yeah, I like it, but it is a little, it's a little tricky. Well, it's a little tricky. It demands a little bit of work, but it's also, it's such a great name because plume is not what we see used very often. Mm. So that alone has this kind of power to it. But also, I mean, I think a plume is kind of a puff of smoke or sometimes flowers feel like plumage to me. Mm -hmm. So it feels like it's really kind of connected in that way. Again, it, 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 like Jungle, it feels like this thing that kind of probably became you after a while, didn't it? Yeah, and it's also like there's something about everything that I do that feels kind of old world or like rooted in like a, a history of some sort. Um, I never like being super tied to that, but like there is, like I've always felt like an old man or excuse me, like an old lady. Um, so I feel like my sensibilities like lend itself to that. Like my grandmother is like always influencing what I do. So I felt like Plume just had like a history and an elegance to it. Like I always aspire for something a little bit. And also you think Plume, you think of a uh, quill pen and something basically kind of handmade, which is what you do with the work anyway, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, all very intentional. <laughs> 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 well, now I'm glad I asked. But, um, let me turn to you, Clint, and ask you about Coco Cozy. So um, I started Coco Cozy. Coco Cozy started on the, kind of on a whim. I, my best friend, um, uh, she's an investment banker in New York, and I speak to her every single day. And every day I have like some like kooky business idea. Like I was like, <laughs> let's do a restaurant chain called Mondays instead of Fridays. And she's like, that's not. And I was like, how about we do coffee cap? And she was like, what is that? And I was like, it's like when you're at home, you're drinking a cup of coffee, you want to take it with you, there's a cap you put on it, you can just go. And she was like, then how would you put it in your, your cup holder in your car? And I said, well, there'd be coffee bottom. And then she said, there's a thermos for that. So then I, so one day I called her and I said, hey, um, I got this idea. And it was a really good one. It was with this starting to start really codependent, yeah. by the way. <laughs> and then she said, she said, start a blog. And I, at that point, it was about 11 years ago, maybe 12 years ago at this point. And I didn't know what that was, so I Googled it. And I Googled B-L-O-G. And I was like, oh, I can write. I used to be a journalist, and I love writing. And I've just completed a renovation on my tiny little cottage in the Hollywood Hills. And I started writing the blog. And, um, and I didn't actually have a name for it at that point. My first post, um, I think it was just me just saying, I'm going to start. And that's something I always say to people, just start. And then that night after I started, I sat down, and I was like, OK, what am I going to call it? What's it going to be called? And I lived in a really small cottage in the Hollywood Hills. It was, I think, 700 square feet. And I owned it. It was my first house. And people used to come. And every time they would come, I don't know if they were so like shocked that I lived in such a small home, or they were really like they really loved it. But every time they came in, they said, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful, it's so cozy. And I realized that I did like this aesthetic and it spoke to about a lot of who I am about creating an environment that is like comfortable and cozy and relatable and something that's accessible, something that's chic and accessible. So I liked the word cozy and then I thought about the nickname my grandmother called me um, all my life, which was Coco. And so, um, and so then I just married the two. And along the way, I've had friends say, you know, it might be a little more elegant if you call it something else. And I, and I, and it, like you, um, you know, I don't know that that, you know, the name wasn't necessarily, it wasn't that, it was not intentional, but I've kind of embraced what it is over the years. And I think it kind of speaks to, you know, there's something about relatability. Like one of my friends thought it wasn't chic enough, and I was like, it's fine. I, you know, that's me. I'm not chic enough. <laughs> like sometimes I am. You mean like Coco Chanel's not it, chic? Good well, point. No, but the I cozy, see what the cozy <laughs> aspect felt very, you know, hokey or quirky, and I thought, well, then, you know, if it does, I, you know, maybe people will feel like that they can relate to me more. And so, in the blog was it kind of the the in the beginning, people really felt like that they were, you know, they would write to me and say that they were talking to their friend because I kind of took them through the journey of design and like through my eyes, which was a novice, I didn't know anything and I was a TV executive and literally I was just like, oh my gosh, there's a hydrangea. And I, I literally took them through the whole process of me learning and through my eyes, um, you know, they learn. So I always wanted that accessibility and I think Cozy does speak to, to kind of who the brand turned into. But in all these names, there's this kind of thing that feels almost like they're contradictions. Yeah. But you see them mm. together, you realize there's this kind of marriage of these these opposites, like cozy and cocoa, mm. or bloom and plume, and or jungle. And and, and <laughs> yeah. it's that these things 
are so individual and specific that they almost kind of conjure an aesthetic when you hear them. Mm. And, and I wonder, I was gonna ask, and I'll start with you again because you're so far away and I don't get to talk to you very much. <laughs> um, if you felt just like that, having that, putting a name on it, really gave you an idea as to where to go with it. Yes, um, simply. I think, um, so I've had a lot of different sort of like career subsets um, and, and I spent, for example, like what did you do? Well, I spent I spent quite a few years doing graphic design and branding, oh. and um, and having that um, having that background of doing branding made me think a lot about what made things recognizable. And so early on, and and my blog started. This is my ten year blog anniversary. So. Um, <laughs> uh, but I I felt like. Um, I felt like, you know, the, the social media landscape and the blog blogosphere is a very, very saturated space. And so what are the different, what are my differentiators? And so um, from very early on, I tried to identify what those differentiators were. What does, what do I want each image of mine that I'm putting in the world to have? What do I want each product design to have? How do I want to be expressing myself? And so putting those things into words and making it very, very clear and very simple has been really instrumental for me in growing my brand. So every picture that you see that comes out on the jungle, whether it's a blog or a product design, it's going to have a color, a pattern, and a plant trifecta, and th those things are gonna work together in some kind of way to make something feel really bold and exciting. And um, especially 10 years ago when the blogging landscape and, and the interior trends were very, very white, mm. um, interpret so, that how you will. I'm sorry, uh, so they were very white. <laughs> okay, I'm glad they've changed. Okay. Um, <laughs> Very minimal, very uh, mid-century modern. It was, you know, a, a very clean aesthetic, and my aesthetic is um, opposite of that in in so many ways. It's very warm. It's very cozy. It's very quirky. It's very maximal. It's loud. It's not quiet. Um, it's fun. It's exuberant. Um, it's it's how I think of myself, kind of transmitted into into a space or in home decor. And so by identifying those things and being really crystal clear about it from the very beginning, um, I, I created something that I think is very recognizable. And I, I used to kind of liken it to like a Whitney song that you'd hear on the radio. Even if you'd never heard the song before, you knew it was Whitney. And that was what I was always going for with the clients I was working with and branding. And then once I kind of applied those, those strategies to, my own, to myself and my own brand, how can I do what Whitney did? How can I how can I make myself that identifiable? How can my voice be that clear, and um, and that noticeable? And I guess it's work. It's working. <laughs> no, I, I would say it is. It's, pardon me, please. I, yeah. <laughs> wake yourselves up. Here. Come on. Because um, I would say the same thing to you, Maurice. That that the brand really came to define. Whom, which you, that name came to define you in some way, didn't it give you some clarification? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was, um, flowers are a vehicle for me. Like, I'm a creative person, um, and I've kind of reverse engineered into being an artist. Like, I never felt like that was an acceptable term for me to call myself why because... Would, why would you say that? Uh, because, like, my parents told me I could do whatever I wanted as long as I could support myself and make money, and in my perception of artists, they're poor and like can never figure it out and like it's not very sustainable. So I always went like the commercial route of creativity. So I started in window display, like floral design, felt like this way of being creative, but like everybody has a birthday, everybody gets married. Like, you know, or like we just, there's these markers that you can use as like, ah, there's a sustainable model here. Um, and then how I approached it though, was always from like an artful place. So I never really approached it like a commercial business. It was always kind of like a fashion house or like an art house or that kind of vibe. And so for me, the name like was just an umbrella for housing my creativity. And like that could take on different forms, i.e. now I have a coffee shop. Is there a new, because again, Coco Cozy, I mean, again, all these, these, these names that for me are, are immediately memorable. Mm -hmm. And they have something kind of, and each of them, and I want to get back to that in, in a minute too, has something kind of handmade about them. You know, mm -hmm. they, they feel close to the earth. And the idea of cocoa for me, and, which is a very kind of 
intimate nickname, mm. but and uh, by thinking of it as being couture and cozy, that kind of those yeah. two things together. And it kind of is representative, I think, of me. You know, I think that um, it's interesting when you talk about the juxtaposition because I say you know my, it was my grandmother's nickname, but I always loved the nickname because of Coco Chanel, and I do have this like this side of me that has you know this I would say you know both aspirational uh, and then also that is accessible and attainable. So I knew that I always wanted the brand to be that. And when I designed my first textiles collection, I, um, I remember, I, this is funny, I, I actually drew a bunch of things on a you know, piece of paper. And then I had my CAD design, my you know, CAD designer um, mock it up. And I kept those designs for about a year. And the reason why I didn't ever make them into fabrics was because I felt like they were too simple and too rudimentary. And I had them all copyrighted, the lawyer and me. Every single one of my designs <laughs> is copyrighted. Um, and um, so I sat in them for a year because I felt like, is somebody going to say she is? She doesn't know what she's doing, and she, it's too rudimentary because they were all very graphic. They were like geometric shapes. It was just repeat patterns that were very, very simple. And then, um, and then one day I was with my mom, and I had my computer, and I was like, oh let's just look at these and see if they'd make a nice pillow. And I always knew that I wanted to do something with pillows and textiles, so then we put the, the computer against the sofa and it was like, this would work. And so ultimately it translated into a textiles collection and now I still have a rug collection. And, and um, those designs, you know, people have used them, you know, literally we have rugs that range from thousands of dollars to hundreds of dollars. And those designs you'll see in people's homes from all kinds of ranges, and that's always what I wanted to be, is to make sure that the brand was accessible. That um, I might have times where I'm like a little bit less accessible, and, um, but I always wanted to make sure that the brand had that combination of those two juxtapositions that you're talking about. But I think, and you mentioned something really interesting, just which I want to get back to, that idea of what design was, and for a lot of people still is, which mm -hmm. is there is, how best to put this? A European ideal, shall yeah. we say? Mm -hmm. and, and I was asking myself this question, and I have been for most of my career, and I, no better place to ask it than here, is for me, part of the African-American aesthetic is that it is touchable, that it is not remote, mm -hmm. that it, it may be aspirational, but we don't want to exclude ourselves from yeah. the community. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's something that exists in all of your work. And I just wonder how... Con you were smiling. Is it a conscious thing for you? Or? Um, <clears throat> you know, it's interesting because I spent so much time in Europe. And, and because, because of that, um, I think I was sort of used to othering myself and being othered. Um, and and the, the, the learnings and the teachings that I got from there, when I came back here, I found it was so easy, you know, both, at, you know, being so different from so many people in the design industry, being a woman of color, you know, I'm also Jewish, I'm also, there's so many things that I, that make me feel like an outsider, um, that I sort of flipped the script a little bit on it, and I was like, this is what makes me dope. <laughs> and, and so I really embraced that and used it in my work as much as possible and injected as much of of my own cultural heritage as I could in my work and 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 still today whether I'm painting or, or designing service pattern designs or product designs I'm always looking towards my cultural heritage and my community for inspiration and so so many of my designs have West African influences and so many of them have um, influences from my Jewish cultural heritage as well um, and for me, fusing those things, which is really, you know, how I identify and who I am, um, I think has made my work much better and has made me stand out in a crowd, um, not just me personally, but also my work stylistically. People are like, oh, where does the style come from? And I'm like, it comes from inside me because this is who I am and this is how I was raised and this is, this is my community. Um, because I was wondering when you, when you brought up Italy, you never feel more black than when you're in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Correct. <laughs> Italy's the only place I had a gun pulled on me by police. Wow. The other was Canada. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're and you and grew up in Texas? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> but uh, but uh, what I was going to say is that when you're there, I just wonder when you came back and you felt like, well, there's part of myself I was just sublimating or because I wasn't in the community, I wasn't able to make that kind of identification. So. Because your work is really, and all your work is, about building kind of community through the work, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, 
I think when you're in a community where you really, really stand out, I mean, I grew up in Berkeley. So in Berkeley, I did not stand out. Every other kid in Berkeley looks like me. Um, and so once I left Berkeley, it was like, oh, okay. I'm the first black person you're meeting. I'm the first Jew you're meeting. I'm the first, 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 first. And in a way it sort of amplified my pride and my, um, my urge to sort of identify even more as, as, as black or as Jewish. So I found myself at, at synagogue more than I would have otherwise. I found myself hanging out with the Senegalese guys in Florence because there are a lot, there's a big, the, the black community in Florence is, is from Senegal. So, you know, I found myself trying to identify in those ways and, and it was like just searching for that community. Now, ultimately, um, when you are a foreigner, you know, you also find a foreign, you know, you're just sort of looking for yourself, but all those things that are, that are different about you, um, you can kind of either hide it and try and blend in, or you can just say, fuck it, this is me. And, um, and, and so that's what I did. <laughs> Cause I would ask you that too, Maurice, cause it feels like you found a way to sort of like make community and, 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 and bring yourself into that. And I wonder if that was a difficult process for you as well, just kind of opening yourself up to that. Yeah, I mean, I think like, so when I was younger, I was really obsessed with European fashion. So I would study the fashion shows like which 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 crazy. Design, which, which So Europeans? Dior with John Galliano for Dior, Alexander McQueen, Chanel, Christian Lacroix is one of my favorites. Victor and Roth, like so I just like it, all the fashion shows just like boom boom boom. But you boom, just describe like, a bunch of really aggressive designers in that period. Galliano and Victor and Roth oh, were really out there to be seen. Yeah, like bomb, like <laughs> true like craftsmanship, like excellent, amazing. Um, but it started to shape like the way that I um, put aesthetics in a hierarchy, right? Mm. So like as a, as a whole, as, in society at large, like we put that at the top, right? But then we look at like a Sean John or a FUBU or, you know, um, Fat Farm, one of those is like less than, but it's just like different than, you know? And so um, my business that I'm in is like extremely luxurious. Uh, the most pe most of the people that are able to afford what I do don't look like me. So, um, like, and it's in those kind of aesthetic realms. But like, at the end of the day, I'm not a white lady that can have a baby. So, like, I can't function like that. And like, I actually ended up having kind of a not a rub, but like this weird moment where I was like, oh, I try to live in this way that like. I am not. Um, and when that happened, then you're just like, wait, something like, not that I was trying to be white or trying to be like not myself, but my art expression was in this realm that like who I am inside just comes out. So like watching my grandmother's creativity, watching like my mother's creativity, watching my uncle's creativity. Like these you are. You said something to me before we got started, because I said, your work feels so much to me like it's vibe-based. And like I said, I know you can walk into a room with your eyes closed and feel what's wrong with it. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> 100%. And so, like, how I feel and how things happen, like, would just come out anyway. And so I think what, in turn, what I just came to embrace is that, yes, I've studied on my own or in school or whatever these different modes of, like, looking at art, but, like, embracing that like I'm only good at doing me I'm only good at being myself and using that as a vehicle to like create my own voice I'm also always like kind of in the name as well there's always like a yin and a yang you know there's like balance like you know the earth is 50% in light 50% in darkness 100% of the time and so I try to apply that principle to everything in my life right um, and so I can't take anything I do too seriously, but like I also reverence it. Like, I, you know, it's really beautiful, but like, who cares? Or like, it's like, <laughs> I spend a lot of time on it, but it doesn't matter. Like, so you know, there's like this rigor, but there's a casualness so that it is approachable. It's like, nobody needs to know the crazy amount of engineering that goes into making our arrangements. Was it pretty? Did it, did you like it? Great. You know, if you really want to know, I can get into it, but like, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. It's like for the end effect, you know? So it's like I want to put out 
really incredible detailed things that like look very effortless, right? Mm. Um, and you don't know that it's really hard until you attempt to do it. And that's how it should always be, wow. you know? Like, it's just, it's easy. Mm. And that's what makes something feel approachable. Now, the flip side of that is then like, everybody thinks they can do what you can do. I mean, they think <laughs> that you shouldn't be paying for it or whatever, which then gets a little tricky because then you have to like prove your value. But like, ultimately, like, I don't want it to seem overworked or like hard. It's like, ugh, how unelegant, you know? Let me ask you that too, Colette, because it, this idea of just trying to find out who you are yeah. and being a person of color doing this, mm -hmm. and you actually having a whole other career. Mm -hmm. So it really was your side also. Yeah. And so talk about that. So, you know, it's interesting because, you know, listening to Justine and Maurice right now, the, um, you know, identity, I think that this era right now has been extremely helpful for me personally. In what way? And it, in the sense that I think that um, the, the, you know, I grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood. I went to, you know, Wellesley College and Georgetown University, and I, and I, I wasn't surrounded by, you know, in law school I was kind of, but uh, around a big black community except for my family, which I have a very large family who were all very close. Um, and I think that that idea of, like, of, of becoming like part of what everything else is, or becoming similar, became just part of like a natural way that I was living until the last couple of years, I must say, where I've just been like loud and noisy. Like it's just like I the 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 things that I um, maybe didn't want to stand out about, I feel very important. I feel very they are very important to stand up about. I mean, I, it's not that I didn't stand up for things, but I feel like. My identity is now coming through in my voice, in the way, and what I do, in the way I design, and what I want to say about my brand. And it's like it's, which is, I want to be different. I want to be me, and me can be this amalgamation of this heritage of my mother's from Haiti, <laughs> and then also a life that I've led, that I've seen these things, whether, whether it's going to the. Um, uh, you know, going to the runway shows in Milan and actually, you know, was sitting at the Dolce & Gabbana show. And I've been, I've seen these things, but my life, it's okay because I've had friends who've said to me, oh, you're too white or you're, or, or white people that are like, oh, you're black. I am me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's like, I'm me. And so I'm an amalgamation of all those things. And now I embrace that. And I really recognize that, like, you know, I've had, um, you know, uh, an uh, interesting career in a, in a business that Elvis also knows. It's predominantly white, and um, and and I have never sublimated myself in those in that career at all. I've always spoken up um, because it's been sometimes egregious what's happened in those um, in those arenas. And I've been in the business for years and years. Um, but now I really feel like the creative voice is is really embracing. You know, it was interesting. I just put a Haitian painting in my house, you know, for my mom. You know, I used to be like, oh, mom, what are those Haitian paintings? And now I want <laughs> one in my house. And, like, I really have been trying to embrace who I am and those differences and then really translate that into what, in the way I design. See, <clears throat> it's also interesting to me because we're at a, I think, um, a real momentum point in a, yeah. the culture where the, the, the real cultural contribution of African Americans is finally being recognized in a way that's undeniable now. You turn on the Fox Network, when somebody says 24 7, that's hip hop. So the mm -hmm. way we have shaped this culture in so many ways, big and small, mm -hmm. it seems like for me, in the weird way, not in a weird mm -hmm. way, in the very specific <laughs> way. <laughs> There you go. Uh, <laughs> but, if, yeah, but it feels like to me that in a lot of ways the, the design world is kind of the, the final frontier. Yeah. Because there's been so much in terms of visual uh, contribution, in terms of the literal rhythm of this country, in terms of the way language is spoken, in terms of the way people deport themselves. Um, but in, for some reason, literally having people bring that into their home is about crossing a, a physical and, 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 and literal, uh, literal figure to a threshold, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think spot on on what you just said. And I think really um, we can thank, maybe that's the wrong word, but I think the internet and the general democratization, democratization of design in general that's happening right now is allowing more space for all different kinds of people to enter design when it was something that was um, 
held up for an elite group up until the last decade. I mean, really. And so even even now, I mean, going to the big design shows, if you, anyone goes to High Point in North Carolina or the Vegas show, I mean, when I first started going to these shows five years ago, I was oftentimes the only person of color that I saw that wasn't a service person working there. That recently. That recently. <laughs> No, not kidding at all. Now it's already so much better, um, but it, it, it's such a homogenous industry and at so many different levels. And, and I've been you know, in the creative rooms at pretty much every large home decor corporation that you can think of in this country. And um, more often than not, I'm the only person of color in the room. Yeah. And that's up until last week. <laughs> the same experience I had that literally last week in New York City. So um, it, there's still a lot of work to be done. And I think that until the creative rooms at these larger corporations are more diverse, we're, we're gonna still hit lots of roadblocks. But um, I do see some amount of improvement, um, especially when it comes to visibility on social and people who are starting to make noise more on social and just the general um, democratization of design in that sense. Because if you're good at what you do and if you make beautiful things and if you inspire people, you can make it now, no matter what color you are or no matter where you grew up. Um, and I don't even think that was the case five to 10 years ago. Mm. Um, I really think that's just starting now um, and so it's, it's an exciting time in that sense because I think, I think that um, platforms like Instagram and, um, and blogs in general just allow for people to make a stamp for themselves. The thing I would also say about that though is the trickier part about what, at least I could say what I do, is like I... I think what I do is very important in terms of it really brings a space to life. It's really beautiful. It's like so nice to reflect on things um, and be like, wow, that's a beautiful flower and it's alive and it has a short lifespan. Um, but I think for most people of color, they're trying to put food on their table. They're trying to survive that um, experiential art um, is like... Impractical. A, very impractical. And so it, it's a tricky space to get into because it's not very sustainable. I definitely would rather buy a pair of Jordans that like 200 people can see me wear five times, you know, than like a flower arrangement that gets delivered to my house that costs more than the shoes and dies in three days. Like the effect of what that can have, even though it's like a beautiful, amazing experience. Um, and I think that like, because I think about the sustainability of my business and how hard it is to do that without having a ton of money, which I don't have. Um, and so for me, like I have been trying to collect my little coin as I do little jobs, reinvesting to like, that's why I pivoted a little bit. I still have my brand, but like to doing the coffee shop because it's a much more approachable space. And also it's, it's, it's a way to sort of change minds from the, literally from the ground up. Correct. So it's a space where like you can see flowers on a regular basis and see how they transform a space. You can see like what embracing color and design and, like these different things. Like it's a it's a little playground for me where I have a physical space to do that. Now getting to that point was miserable. It was really, really hard as a person of color. Like me and my brother ended up doing it together and um, you know. I think we got an SBA loan. We both worked really hard. I mean, his credit is amazing. Mine was a hot ass mess. But like, I worked really hard to like get that in order so that I could like work on my business and expand it because it was really important. So once I did that, I was like, "Bitch, I'm ready. Let me. We got our little business plan. It's like flawless. Like, I got my. I got the receipts because my credit score is amazing. And you yeah. know." <laughs> and I still got like we still got like 30 no's from like every bank 
almost every bank because said no be, be, to our Because project. there hadn't been something like that before. Correct. And people don't people don't go for like quote startups. Um, and we ended up going with like yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's so weird. They actually told you people would go for startups. Yeah. Because like they're 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 it's small they don't make any money off of these small little SBA loans. I mean everybody talks about it, but like it it's like kind of a it's a catch-22. It, it they really They haven't is. given it to you, but yeah. you have to go through this hoop to get it. They don't want to give you the hoop. And so we ended up going with, uh, or we ended up going with, like, I had any choice in the matter. Um, uh, a small black bank, like, uh, that, that's what they do. They, like, loved our story. They, like, I didn't even realize that it was, like, pitching a movie. You know? It was, like, a whole thing. It was, like, they had to buy into our story. They had to, like, buy into who we were. And like, it was wild. Um, and that's how we were able to do it. But like, when you do all the steps, when you work super hard and you do all these things, like, it's crazy how hard it still is to like function in the design space. The reason why I brought it up is because I think the design space is last because it still is seen as a, um, as like a, well, I don't need it. A luxury. It's mm. still, it still seems like a luxury, you know? But like, the, like, everybody wants to be in a pretty space. You just don't know it until you go into one. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was like, and then after opening my coffee shop, I get why every coffee shop just has white walls. <laughs> <laughs> everything is so expensive. The city makes everything so brutally difficult. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's, it took us 11 months to get electricity, like to, from like, they made us upgrade the whole building, not just our space. So then like going back and forth with the city, with like contractors, with engineers. And I mean, you know, there goes all the money right there. Mm -hmm. But then I already bought the marble for the like countertop. <laughs> and, like, and it's just real pretty, you know, like it was, so, so it, but because I'm so committed to what I'm doing, I mean, you just have to be like diligent about it. Like, I don't care. Like, I, I just want, things to be pretty. Like my brother, like as I was like, if it was up to me, all this shit would come from Costco. <laughs> um, you know, and if it was up to me, everything would be custom. So we would be in like a really bad situation. So it's a nice balance. Um, Sounds like brothers to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I think it's like, it's an important point to I think bring up that I think the reason why we're kind of in that space is because it's really, really hard to get into and sustain. Yeah, it's, is that, go ahead. I want you to. Well, you know, so my perspective is a kind of a combination of both. Um, so I've sat in a lot of um, boardrooms and executive rooms where I'm the only black person. And they're, you know, and these are the decision makers. The issue is that I think that there, there isn't diversity at these top ranks, too. Exactly. Absolutely. And, and one of the things is interesting being a senior executive, I used to see so many people that would get hired because they were friends of friends of friends. But yet when a black person came into the room or a person of color, it could be an Asian person or a Hispanic person, what are their qualifications? I mean, I don't know if they quite fit. I mean, there was always a really strange standard mm -hmm. that, we, that, that people would hold you know, people of color too, that it wasn't the same. Like, it was like, oh, he's a good guy. He generally can talk sales or he has relatable skills or transferable skills. But yet when it was somebody diverse, it had to be on the nose. And so what you find in a lot of these industries is that the standard is there haven't been a lot of people doing it. So in order to break down the barriers, there's not a lot of openness to those transferable skills. And there's not the, the, the kind of, you know, um, you know, nepotism or cronyism to a certain extent. Access. So you, yeah, exact access. So there's limited access. So I think until you see that kind of change that you'll, I mean, in the executive ranks of big companies like Williams Sonoma or things like that, where you'll see, you'll start to see a little more diversity. Um, and I think that to Justine's point, the idea that this, this whole idea of us all being in the social media world, that is the beauty of it. Because when I started my blog, I knew that I had my own power. So I was this executive, kind of a, hit a glass ceiling, you know, at the vice president level. And, um, and I kind of just took my career into my own hands. And that was, that was very empowering. So I think that there, you know, I think that the, where social media and blogging and this ability to be able to have your own voice and to really actually control your own voice, I think that that can be something that 
you you really embrace, and I think that that can actually negate some of the issues that we're seeing with all these corporations because people really can be these independent contractors or these independent voices, and they can really make a difference. I honestly think that. We are up at 40, so let's thank these guys for being here tonight. Oh, my gosh. Thank you.